So this morning we have the opportunity, briefly, not a lot of time to do this, but we have the opportunity to do something we don't usually get to do, and that is to do this part of the service, the preparation of the portion of the service. Proscomedia is called, but that just means preparation, so since I'm not Greek, I'll stick with preparation, uh, which is done just before matins, right now, when we prepare the bread that has been brought and the wine and get everything ready for the liturgy. And um, the very first thing after we've done prayers of preparation and uh, vesting is a washing of the hands, which these days includes a washing of the hands using uh, hand disinfectant as well, which we've always been really careful about, but we do that anyway. Uh, But that's a more new phenomenon. The uh, traditional part of this is a hand washing in which I will pray the prayer that I will pray for myself and for Deacon George as we do this. I will wash my hands in innocence and I will come past thine, thine altar, O Lord, that I may hear the voice of thy praise and tell of all thy wondrous works. O Lord, I have loved the beauty of thy house, the place where thy glory dwelleth. Destroy not my soul with the ungodly, nor my life with men of blood, in whose hands are iniquities. Their right hand is full of bribes, but as for me in mine innocence have I walked. Redeem me, O Lord, and have mercy on me. My foot is stood in uprightness, and the congregations will I bless thee, O Lord. So having done that, we begin the service of preparation. And I am always struck when I am doing this at the reality that the liturgy and the worship is not something that I'm doing by myself. It's never that. It's always a corporal communal action. And even the bread that I'm looking at, I'm very aware that I didn't break this, I didn't bake this bread. I didn't have a part of that. This is prepared by those who have uh, asked and have offered to do it the very bread itself, the prosphora, the offering, uh, is something that uh, is a part of the worship that happens long before I'm ever here. So last night in somebody's oven, this bread was was, uh, being baked and prayers were being prayed, and it is an integral part of our worship, as is the wine that we will be using. And for us, the wine, just like any wine that you would normally use, we get this from the monastery at Calistoga, but it's It is a normal wine, uh, which is something that becomes part and parcel of our worship service. So to begin with, we just uh, pray some introductory prayers. God, be gracious to me, a sinner, and have mercy upon me. God, be gracious to me, a sinner, and have mercy upon me. God, be gracious to me, a sinner, and have mercy upon me. Make ready, O Bethlehem, for Eden hath opened for all. Prepare, O Ephratah, for the tree of life hath blossomed forth from the tree, from the cave, from the virgin. For her womb did appear as a spiritual paradise in which is planted the divine plant, whereof eating we shall live and not die as Adam. Christ shall be born, raising the image of old. Thou hast redeemed us from the curse of the law by thy precious blood, nailed to the cross, pierced by the spear. Thou hast poured forth immortality upon mankind, O our Savior. Glory to thee. And now we will bless one of the loaves. There can be up to five loaves uh, used for a service, depending on the size of the church. Uh, In this case, we have three, uh, and I will probably only use two of these, and I will save one for uh, later use, freeze it and save it for later use as we need it uh, later on uh, in the year in a a weekday liturgy or some other time when we may need it. The bread, which you cannot see, uh, has a seal on it. In the middle of this bread, there's a cube, and the letters say, I see exe Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos Nika, which means conqueror. And this little middle cube, which you probably can't see from that far away, this little cube is what becomes the body and blood. This is the part that we cut out. It's known as the lamb once we, sec- once we uh, cut it apart. And this is what's on the patent all the way during the service. That is the part that is uh, kind of front and center. There are prayers that we pray which, er, with every step of this as we prepare it and cut it. And I will pray those prayers now. As a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And as a righteous lamb before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. 
and who shall describe his generation? Now that I've cut this lamb from the rest of the loaf, the prosper loaf, I have it just by itself, and because there are just a few of us here this morning that will be receiving, I'm going to cut it fairly well down so there's not a large amount of it because there are not that many of us to receive yet. However, by God's grace, we have an announcement today that means we will be doing lots more of this for everyone, so don't lose heart. Now I'm gonna cut a crosswise pattern in the back of it. Some of what I'm doing is uh, very uh, theological, speaks to the sacrifice of Christ, the birth of Christ. Some things are just very practical, and this is one of them. I cut a crosswise uh, slice in the back of the lamb, almost going all the way through, but not quite. And the reason for this is that when I am actually doing the service where we break the body, the, break the lamb into pieces and put it in the chalice, it just makes it easier to break it without crushing it. Deacon George is always standing beside me doing uh, a lot of what I'm doing now. Uh, we're not using a deacon for two weeks. We're holding off on uh, having a deacon serve with us, so I'm doing it. The next part that he would be doing is to begin to add the body, in the, the wine and the water, just a little bit of water and the wine into the chalice and the prayer that we pray, blessed is the union of thy holy things always now and ever and unto the ages of ages, amen. Once again, it's humbling to know that everything we use comes from a very natural place. Bread from a store, wine from a, a winery, a liquor store, wherever. Um, very material, practical things just like the rest of us. We are human beings and God takes us where we are. He doesn't just love the spiritual side of us. He takes, he loves all of us, including the physical presence. So that's a, a constant reminder as I'm doing this part of the service. Now, um, I'm going to be cutting various other pieces and there are commemorations and prayers that we do as we go through this. I'm watching my clock here too, as I always have to at this time, there's so much. Oftentimes, always in fact, when the, when the things are more normal, we have a reader doing the prayers. Uh, Shamas John is usually here doing the prayers of communion, the pre-communion prayers as I'm doing this, which is helpful to me because it helps keep everyone focused and I don't need a lot of distractions. And hearing those prayers is very helpful to me, but it's helpful to all of us as well because we don't just come to church and switch a, switch a switch into the spiritual zone we prepare ourselves. So as he's preparing, everyone here is hearing the beautiful prayers of preparation for communion, which are going on as I'm doing this. So I'm gonna begin cutting out various pieces and commemorating, remembering uh, those who have gone before us. It's not scandalous to remember that we're not the first ones on the boat. We have 2000 years worth of people who have been here praying, living, dying, and we commemorate them, we remember them because they're here worshiping with us. And the first, of course, is the mother of God through whom God incarnate, through whom God became incarnate in this world, taking his body and blood through hers genetically. So she's always the first in the commemoration and the prayer is in honor and memory of our most blessed and glorious Lady Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary through whose intercessions do thou accept, O Lord, this sacrifice upon thy most heavenly altar. Having commemorated the Virgin Mary, if we had five loaves, we'd be doing a different one of these on each of the loaves. We're not going to be doing that just because of the size, but now we do a part of the service that allows us to commemorate the saints and martyrs that have gone before us. And that is done, you won't be able to see this because of the distance again, but I'll try and describe what I'm doing. On this particular portion of the bread, that I'm cutting out, there are nine little diamonds. And each of those little diamonds represent a category of saints, martyrs, various uh, categories of those that the church especially pulls out and remembers at this time. So I'm gonna be going through those and I'm watching my time, which I'm actually doing very well today. 
So we started with the Virgin Mary, and now each of these, which I am going to cut out separately, represent themselves and a category. So it's bigger than just the person or the saint that we remember. Uh, it includes that person, but it also includes anyone else in that same uh, genre or category of saints or uh, angels. So the very first one is, uh, of course, the angelic powers that are always ministering with us. They never miss a liturgy. They never miss a service. They're always here because they would always want to be uh, in the presence of God, worshiping him. That's what they do. In honor and memory of the great angelic leaders, Michael, Gabriel, and of all the bodiless powers of heaven. That's the first of the nine categories. Second category is for the holy prophets. Of the honorable, glorious prophet, forerunner, and Baptist John, the holy, glorious prophets, Moses, Aaron, Elijah, Elisha, David, Jesse, the three holy children, Daniel the prophet, and of all the holy prophets. The church didn't just start on the day of Pentecost. Some people even say it's wrong to say that the church was born on Pentecost because in some ways it wasn't at all. It was born long before in the Old Testament. We don't ignore the Old Testament saints, the prophets, and those who gave themselves for God to take us to this place. So that's the second one. The third one is the holy apostles. The holy glorious and all lot of the apostles, Peter and Paul and the twelve, the seventy, and all of all the holy apostles and equals to the apostles equals to the apostles includes women apostles. Uh, after the first century and second century, St. Thecla being one of them, equal to the apostles. So if anyone wants to look at all the men in our church and say we're sexist, we are absolutely not. Because if you look at someone who is called equal to the apostle, that is something that not very many people would say about anyone. And yet, and that is the uh, title that we commemorate on that particular one. So that's the third the holy apostles. Fourth is the hierarchs and ecumenical teachers. Of our fathers among the saints, great hierarchs and ecumenical teachers, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, John Chrysostom, Athanasius, Cheryl of John the Merciful, Patriarchs of Alexandria, Nicholas of Myra, Spiridon of Trimethus, Nectarius of Pentapolis, and of all the holy hierarchs. So again, it includes all of those hierarchs, but it also includes a huge number greater than that. This is just a, a, a representative uh, calling out of some names of a much larger category, um, many of whom we will never know in this life or know of in this life. And that especially applies to the, to the fifth of these, the fifth uh, little diamond that I'm putting out, and that is the martyrs. The holy proto-martyr and archdeacon Stephen, the holy glorious great martyrs, George the trophy bearer, Demetrius the mirror streaming, Theodore the soldier, Theodore the general, the higher martyrs, Polycarp Ignatius, the god bearer of Antioch, Haralampos, Leftherios, the holy women martyrs, Thecla, Barbara, Anastasia, Catherine, Kyria, Kifotini, Marina, Perskeva, and Irene, and of all the holy hiram martyrs, right victorious martyrs, and confessors. There were more people killed for their faith in the, 19, in the 20th century in Russia than were killed in the previous uh, 1900 years, 19 centuries, just in Russia. And we don't know but a fraction of the names. God knows them, and that's what counts. The next one is the ascetics. Of our venerable and God-bearing fathers who shown in the ascetic life, Anthe the Great, Ephthemius, Paisius, Sabbath the Sanctified, Theodos, Theodosius, the head of monasteries, Anufrius, Athanasius, Peter of Athos, and of all the venerable men and women. The next category is the unmercenary healers. They had to be crazy. They were doctors and healers, and they didn't charge for it. Thank God. Of the holy, glorious, and wonder-working unmercenaries, Cosmos, Damian, Cyrus, John, Patalemos, Hermalios, and of all the holy unmercenary healers. The next one is uh, Joachim and Anna and the saints of the day. Of the holy and righteous ancestors of God, Joachim and Anna, Joseph the betrothed, Simeon the God receiver, and now we do the saint of the day. There's always a day that is pulled out for the uh, saint for the day of the week and in uh, the day of the year and in this day on Mar May the 10th the saints are the Apostle Simon the Zealot and the Venerable Lawrence of Egypt whose memories we commemorate this day of the holy glorious and all laudable Apostle James brother of God first hierarch of Jerusalem patron protector of this holy church and of all the saints at whose supplication visit us O God and grant us our petitions which are unto salvation and life everlasting 
of our Father among them. And the last category, the final category is uh, St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, the authors of the liturgies, the two major liturgies that we pray throughout the year. Uh, in this case, it's uh, St. John Chrysostom. Of our Father among the saints, uh, John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople. And that, those are the nine categories of the saints that we pray for. And now I'm going to take just a moment and I will let you look. We did put online, I'm not, I believe they got on there. The text of what I'm doing is online. So if you want to take just a few minutes while I do my own personal prayers, private prayers, um, and then we'll uh, conclude the service. But um, again, it's an opportunity to say this is something we all do together. This is not just the priest doing his thing and earning his paycheck. This is a part of our worship and it, and it starts and ends with prayer, and that's what we're doing. So I'm gonna do my private prayers. I pray for all of you, for my family, for my godchildren, for all the priests, for the priests that ordained, that was uh, uh, my sponsor of my ordination. There are a number of people that I pray for, depending on how time is going. Sometimes I pray rather briefly for them. Remember, O oh Lord and Master and lover of mankind, every Orthodox, every Bishop, the Orthodox who rightly divideth the word of thy truth, our Father and Metropolitan Joseph. I'm praying now for the Metropolitans and Bishops that I am personally aware of and those in this archdiocese and throughout the world. I remember uh, Metropolitan Jonah Paphausen, who I knew when he was a priest and is now with the uh, Church Abroad, but I always remember him at this time. All those who are serving as, metropol as bishops, archbishops, priests, and deacons. I remember, Lord have mercy, uh, Father Joseph Tange, uh, the priest that ordained me, Father David Barr, um, the priest in this area, Father John Magulius, Father uh, Joseph, um, uh, Father Pete in Stockton, all of the priests in the deanery and throughout uh, the world, especially those that I know. The diaconate in Christ and also the deacons. Said this before in church, but I'll say it again. Deacon Mark Baker, who served with us for some three years or so, would always be at my side as normally Deacon George is now and in different times and other times when we can serve together with a deacon. And for all those years, he would always pray for the same group of people. And then when he passed away, I would be standing here and he wouldn't be, and I could still hear his voice praying for his wife, his children, his godchildren, those he remembered, those he loved. I always remember and I still feel, mystically, I still feel that he's a part of what I'm doing and of course he is. I pray especially for those who suffer in this church, always for those who have brought the bread, they're always commemorated at this time and at the liturgy at the great entrance anyone who is especially in needs, uh, sick, ill, uh, celebrating a birthday, feast day, and everyone. Secondly, the category of the departed, which I pray for those in my own life uh, who have departed this life. Again, we pray for blessed memory and forgiveness of sins for all Orthodox kings, patriarchs, bishops, priests, deacons, monastics, every priestly and monastic order, blessed and ever memorable founders of this holy church, of the holy and righteous founders of this benefactors of this holy house, priests and deacons who have served therein, and all our fathers and brethren who have fallen asleep in thy communion, in the hope of resurrection and to life everlasting, O Lord and lover of mankind. 
and I always remember Deacon Mark at this time, the little particle that I'm taking from the bread, as I was trained, there are differences, but I take the living from the, from the top part of, the, of, the, of the, the bread itself and the departed, I take from the bottom part. Sometimes you can see this done differently. Sometimes a priest will stand with the loaf and, and just, this is called the spear. Parts of this are highly symbolic, but just kind of sh shave little fragments off as he's praying these prayers. Officially, we only pray for, at this point, on the patent, Orthodox Christians who have departed this life. However, I always include in that category those Christians who were not Orthodox, who in my life uh, were responsible for my becoming a Christian in the first place and being Orthodox and on whose shoulders I stand. So I always remember them um, privately as I am doing this portion. And now we sense. Now we're going to complete this, and this goes back to the practical side, by simply covering the gifts so that they'll be ready for the great entrance, which will take place in the middle of the service. That is a whole other subject. In the earliest days, of what I'm doing today didn't really finalize itself till around the 11th century or so, maybe even a little bit later, exactly in this form, but there's a much longer history to it that also goes into why we do the Great entrance with the gifts. There's a, whole, there's a whole piece of that. Deacon George, if I could have the incense, please. Um, there's a whole bigger piece of that, and we're just a small part of a 2,000 year history of the development of the liturgy and the preparation for the liturgy. And since we offer unto thee, O Lord, as an odor of spiritual sweetness accepted upon the heavenly altar, send down upon us, return the grace of thine all holy spirit. Now I'm going to put various things on the, ch on the chalice and on the patent to prepare them for uh, the great entrance and for safely being moved from here to here in the great entrance. And the first is simply called the star, and that just protects it. But it remem the commemoration of the memory is the star of Bethlehem. Behold, the star came to rest over the place where the young child was laid. Second is the cover that's going to go over the paten, which is the plate part of this. The Lord is king, the Lord is clothed, majesty, the Lord is clothed himself, he has girt himself, for he has established the world which shall not be shaken. And the third one will be for the chalice. If you've ever wondered why, when I'm doing the great entrance, I have a list. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I have a list of names that I carry. I pray for those names. Some of the ones that I've mentioned, those who are ha celebrating feast days, birthdays, so those who are in illness or in infirm, those who brought the uh, holy bread for the day, I always put them on the chalice, so, on the patent, so that I can remember them in the great entrance. And then the, and then the chalice. Thy virtue, O Lord, has covered the heavens and the earth is full of thy praise. And then a prayer. Finally, before the prayer. This is the cover that Deacon George would be wearing over his shoulders during the great entrance. It's called the Air, A-E-R. Blessed art thou, our God, who art thus, O please, glory to thee, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who art thus, O please, glory to thee. Blessed art thou, our God, who thus, O please, glory to thee. Upon the secret setting forth of precious gifts, let us pray. O God, our God, who did send forth the heavenly bread, the food of the whole world, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, 
Redeemer, Benefactor, blessing and sanctifying us, do thou thyself bless this oblation and receive it upon the most heavenly altar. Remember our good and the lover of mankind, those who brought this offering, those for whom they brought it. Preserve it blameless in the celebration of thy divine mysteries, for sanctified and glorified is thine all honorable and majestic name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Holy God, the unoriginate Father, Holy Mighty, the co-eternal Son, Holy Immortal, the all-holy Spirit, O Holy Trinity, glory to thee, glory to thee, O Christ our God, and our hope, glory to thee, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages, amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, may he who rose from the dead, Christ our true God, through the intercessions of our all immaculate and all blameless and holy mother, our Father among the saints, John Christus, and Archbishop of Constantinople and of all the saints have mercy on us and save us for as much as he is good and he alone loveth mankind through the prayers of our holy fathers O Lord Jesus Christ our God have mercy on us and save us amen and that would conclude the preparation part of the service everything else is everything is now ready and as soon as it's time for orthros which it is this will be waiting on this table the prothesis table and when it's time for the great entrance by the time Deacon George and I in normal times would be coming here to pick it up. Uh, that's what we were picking up and that's how it's prepared. The bread of course is taken and uh, cut into pieces for those who are uh, receiving the blessed bread. And that's how we do this. So I will conclude this and we will start Orthros in uh, 90 seconds.